Welcome to Vows to Keep Radio with David and Tracy Sellers. The mission of Vows to Keep is to help couples develop a biblically healthy marriage through the application of God's Word and a deeper relationship with Him. They desire to help you and your spouse grow closer to each other and closer to the heart of God's design for your marriage. Now, here's David and Tracy with today's broadcast. For over 30 years, a couple I know, we'll call them John and Jane, kept score. It started very early in their marriage when Jane took on a part-time job because the kids, you know, they were getting started in elementary school. Jane wasn't making much, but she wanted the pay to use as she saw fit. John wasn't for it. He didn't even want her to take the job, but he responded in frustration rather than thinking about it from the standpoint of generosity. And so started a struggle. When an extra bill came due, who was going to pay for it? When a school obligation demanded time away from work, who would give that time up? Even the simplest situations became a check to see who was up and who was down on the marital teeter-totter. Who would be forced to give was generally decided by who had given last. If we're talking about scores today, if you're a sports fan, you're going to relate to this story. In 2015, during a full-length high school boys basketball game, a very unique record was set. The teams worked hard. The ball went from one basket to the other. Sweat trickled down each player's back as they played offense and defense. What's so unusual about that? The scoreboard. At the end of the game, guess what it read? Two to zero. That's right, two to nothing. Each player certainly was trying their best. There were shots that bounced off the backboard, shots that bounced off the rim. There were what I would like to call whirlpool shots. You know, the kind that swirl around the hoop, but bounce out at the last second. Everyone was trying their best, even following the plays to the letter. Sometimes it can seem like this in our marriages. We keep making the shots, hoping one's going to go in. All the while, we're keeping a close eye on that scoreboard. We're well aware of that big lit up number that constantly announces not only my performance, but my wife's. We can even be thinking, what in the world is going on? How is it possible that their score is down that much? They should know by now how to make points in this relationship. If you've been married very long, you've probably heard the advice, don't keep score in your marriage. That is good advice for sure, especially if you're looking at your spouse's shortcomings. We're going to explore today on Vows to Keep Radio with humble hearts, being willing to recognize that we fall into the trap of keeping score once again. Living like this in marriage can make our days a little topsy-turvy and we can get a little motion sick. So stay with us today as we try to get our balance back, reminding ourselves of how Jesus keeps score. What does the scoreboard look like in your house? Is the wife up two points while the husband tries to make a rebound? You know how it goes. The husband gets the wrong brand of cereal at the grocery store on his way home from work and you scowl at his efforts. He's down a point. The wife didn't pay the electric bill on time, so they got a late fee. She deducts two points from her own score for that. And when the husband stops by the local chocolate store and surprises her with one of her favorites, ding, by her tally, he just gained back at least one of those points he lost at the grocery store the other day. The wife calls a sitter and dresses up for their date. Ding, now the playing field is even again, and he forgives her for forgetting to pay the light bill. Sound familiar? These may not be the exact same scenarios that play out within your four walls, but the emotions that go along with keeping score are all too common in our marriages. One minute we're up emotionally, the next we're down. The deciding factor? That number on the scoreboard. When David and I were first married, he became what I would call a little obsessed with buying this wrecked car that he found on the internet. It was a gold firebird. Now he had fixed cars before and he knew what he was doing. He was raised doing this, but this one was special. This car was rare and highly desirable. And if he could just buy it and repair it, boy, it would sure be worth a lot of money. He figured it would help pay for our student loan debt. Plus he just really, really wanted it. The day came when he bit the bullet. He bought the car sight unseen and had it shipped to our house. It came in a mangled mess, much worse than the website or photographs described. It took many of our resources and more time than either of us would care to admit to fix that thing. But finally, the time came to sell the car. David had made it as perfect as he could, but there was a little bit of a stoop in his shoulders that day and a heaviness in his heart. The purchase had turned out in the end to be a very poor decision, a costly one financially for us. What effect would this have on our marriage of less than a year? 
Well, that remained to be seen. Much of the outcome would be determined by my response. I had a choice. Would I rub this mistake in his face and bring it up the next time there was a big decision to be made? Would I hug him and tell him I believed in him and that I trusted him for the next time? Would I put this one on the scoreboard of our marriage and demand that he make it up to me to work off his debt, so to speak? In life, there are natural consequences for poor decisions. That poor decision might have been made by you, or maybe it was made by your spouse. They could even have a whole series of bad judgment calls that you've been keeping track of. We all know that these choices can have far-reaching impacts, not only for us personally, but for us as a family, for our bank accounts, and even for our future. But here's something that I had not considered until much later in my marriage. When my spouse misses the shot, when their best attempts bounce off the backboard and there is no rebound, it's not my job to make them pay. This is something that I think we commonly hear referred to as the doghouse mentality. We all laugh when we hear someone say, you know what, my spouse screwed up. That just earned them a night on the couch. When we take this stance, we set up a system of punishment. It puts us in that big black robe sitting in the judge's seat in the courthouse that we have built. When we're always checking the scoreboard, it's a sign to us that we have forgotten the gospel of Jesus Christ. What do I mean by that? You might say, I know the gospel inside and out. I know what Christ did for me. I've gone to church since I was a little kid and I'm there every time the doors are open. I read my Bible all the time. So how can you say I've forgotten the gospel? I can say this because I've experienced this personally and it's still something I have to watch out for. I'm the one who reads my Bible, even teaching it to others. And then I'm the one who flies off the handle when my child spills juice all over the table. I'm the one who, before reaching out to my spouse, thinks about how much this is going to set me back, how much it'll really cost me. You can't read the Bible and not see the gospel, but you can live life and not live out the gospel, even if you're a Christian. That's why sometimes we got to go back to the basics to remind ourselves that Jesus came to fulfill the law so that we could stand justified in his righteousness. So why do we keep trying to make everyone in our lives live up to the law that we have invented? John 1.17 says, The law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness, his grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. Jesus came to show us how to love, despite what it may seem it's costing us. Jesus says in John 15, This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends. When I overlook the gospel of Jesus, not remembering what he's done for me on the cross, I tend to act accordingly. My actions show that I don't remember I have had grace and mercy extended to me over and over. Grace and mercy that I don't deserve. My beliefs come out in how I treat others. It becomes tempting to rub my spouse's nose in their sin or their mistakes, to make them feel lousy about their less than perfect behavior. Tracy taught me such an amazing lesson after we had sold that gold firebird. And I realized early, early on in the process that I had made a mistake in it. But you know what? This is the lesson that she taught me. Keeping score of wrongs is a form of manipulation. She never did it. She didn't use guilt to try to maintain control. Sometimes we can treat our spouse like a child who needs discipline. And we get to feeling like, you know, it's my responsibility. I am actually correct in trying to punish them so that they're going to do it my way next time. And we feel like if this punishment is harsh enough or adequate, like withholding physical affection or not speaking to them for an extended period of time, well, then they'll finally get smart enough that they're not going to repeat this offense. Or at the very least, our spouse will know what our law looks like. I had a horrifying moment the other day. You know the feeling you get when you realize something of consequence that you wish you would have seen sooner? It dawned on me that when I use the doghouse mentality with my husband or my kids, I'm actually emulating Satan, not Christ. You see, Satan is called in Revelation 12, 10, the accuser of the brethren. Christ, in comparison, he took our sins as his own, as if he had committed them, even though he was sinless. He never condemns, even though we deserve it. We imitate our enemy when we keep score. We emulate Christ when we give grace. You've been listening to Vows to Keep Radio with David and Tracy Sellers. 
They'll return shortly with more of today's broadcast. Vows to Keep wants to help. Today's quick marriage question was submitted by a listener like you. Now here's David and Tracy with today's quick marriage question and their response. Dear David and Tracy, I typically hide things from my spouse because I'm afraid of how he's going to react. I feel judged by my husband. What ends up happening is that I feel he doesn't really know who I am anymore. I'm one person when I'm with him and I'm one person when I'm not. What should I do? When I hear your question, the word authenticity comes to mind. When God created relationships, his goal was that we would have a unity that reflects the kind of relationship that Jesus has with the Father. But when we hide what we've done or we try to cover up who we really are with a false front, we only further sever the union that God designed for us to have in marriage. And from personal experience, I actually know what you're talking about. I've been tempted to hide the shopping bags after I went over budget at the store. I don't want him to know about the bowl of ice cream I ate because we agreed to go on a diet together. But when I'm in situations like this, I have a choice, and so do you, to be authentic, to use integrity. You see, authenticity produces intimacy, love out in the open with nothing to hide. But in order to have that with our spouses, we have to start with our relationship with God. God sees and knows the real us. We can't hide anything from Him. Matthew 10, 26 says, There's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. That means I need to be on my knees daily in right relationship with God. I need to have my heart out in the open. I need to stay surrendered. Then I can be honest with myself that He actually really does know the real me. But sometimes I don't want to know the real me myself because it means I have to look on things through God's light, the light of His Word that pierces and divides and sees what's really in me. If I don't open myself up to God daily, then I don't have to deal with the real me and neither does anyone else. And when I do that, I'm not being authentic with God. And when we're not authentic with Him, it affects our relationships with the people in our lives. He knows what's going on with us anyway, so let's start by being open with Him. Authenticity also produces intimacy in marriage. We need to be authentic in our marriages. Your husband's going to see who you really are as you are being authentic before the Lord and really real with him. And this is going to give him confidence in your marriage. He can rest assured that no matter how he acts or the mistakes that he has made, you're going to love him no matter what. He also knows you're going to come to him when something needs to come out into the open. And when you make a mistake, first go to your Savior, ask for forgiveness, and then be open and honest with your husband. That simple step can take a lot of courage, but it will open doors that were previously nailed shut by a lack of honesty. When things are just brushed under the rug and not dealt with biblically, they can pile up fast. And before we know it, we get stuck in a cycle of cover-up. Are you willing today to go to your spouse and be real and honest? There may be some things you need to ask for forgiveness for. And if you're sincere, your husband is going to see that even if he's not willing to forgive you right away. Have confidence that as you are authentic before our gracious God, he's going to forgive you and set you on the right path. And have confidence as you go to your husband and take steps to be authentic with him. The reward is going to be unity in your marriage. Vows to Keep wants to help. If you have a marriage question, please email questions at vowstokeep.com. Vows to Keep will respond to you via email and perhaps use it on the air. Now let's rejoin David and Tracy Sellers with the remainder of today's broadcast. Let's turn together to Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 14, where Jesus is teaching the parable of the vineyard workers. In this passage, we're going to run across six characters or groups of characters. First, there's the master or the landowner of a great vineyard. Then there's the workers, the ones who had worked from sunup the workers that came at nine in the morning, the workers who came at noon, the ones that came at three o'clock, and the workers who came at five and only worked an hour. I'd like you to listen as David reads this passage and pick out the character that you most relate with. Jesus started out by saying, For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. At nine o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw some people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they too went to work in the vineyard. 
At noon and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. At five o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again and saw some more people standing around. He asked, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. That evening, he called the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. When those hired at five o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you paid them just as much as you paid us to work all day in this scorching heat. He answered one of them, Friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. So who did you relate with most in the story of the workers in the vineyard? If I'm honest with myself, I'm like the first guy who had been slaving in the hot sun all day, counting the cost, making sure everything is fair in the end, thinking that it's my job that within my marriage, people get what they deserve, including me, especially me. Of course, I don't necessarily want it to be fair for me because then I actually wouldn't get my fair pay. I may have lazed around while the landowner wasn't looking, but boy, when he glanced my way, I sure hopped to it. If I had an honest and fair evaluation of myself within my marriage, I probably shouldn't receive the entire day's wage either. But it's so easy for me to point out the flaws of others to make sure that they get their just consequence or reward. Did you relate with the workers who came at midday, glad for the opportunity handed to them? Are you the man who didn't take initiative to do the right thing, but in the end you made a good decision to please the master? Maybe you related with the master, deciding to give undeserve grace. If you relate with the person who received a full pay for only working a short time, you might realize that God has the ability to give grace and you have accepted it. It makes it easy to give to someone what they don't deserve. Now, if you're a scorekeeper, you might be the person that's worked all day. You're worried about fairness, but you don't realize how blessed you are that God is not fair as we consider fairness. He has been very unfair to us in giving us what we don't deserve. That's what the gospel is all about. If you find yourself in that last category with your notepad and pen at the ready to take account of your spouse's behavior at any given time, if you're feeling the weight of keeping score in your marriage, then you may realize that keeping score in your spouse's performance is exhausting work. It's a very heavy load to carry, always looking for that next misstep, always wondering, if they're going to redeem themselves from that last point deduction, always wondering if the master is watching them to find them out in their sin, feeling that it's your job to let them know just where they stand with you based upon how they've acted, how they've met your needs or your wants or even your demands. We can tell ourselves that we are the ones that need to demand payment for the wrongs done, forgetting that we serve a master who is just and that we serve a master who has the right to be generous and he chooses to do that through his son, Jesus Christ. If we see ourselves as a recipient of such lavish grace, we realize that God has given us an abundance to be that generous giver, to no longer bestow punishment, but to give extravagantly. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Just like David said, keeping score is heavy, burdensome work. But we don't have to do this anymore. We can rest. We can learn from our Savior. We can take up His way of doing things. We can lay down our load and be yoked to our gentle master, who knows just how to go through this life next to us because he walked the same paths that we do. He had people disappoint him left and right. He was betrayed. He was hurt. He was uncared for. He was cast out and his closest companions made massive mistakes that changed history. So if we want to learn from him, we have to look at how he handled these difficult situations. I love how this verse states so clearly the heart nature of Jesus. The Bible says that he's gentle and humble in heart. A humble heart is one that says, 
I will serve. I will forgive. It's not about me. The one that we are yoked with does not keep score. In fact, he has paid the price for all the negative scores we have ever given or received. Thank you, Lord, for that. Jesus loves us so much that he doesn't want us to carry around this heavy burden of keeping score with each other or even keeping score of our own, like how much we're measuring up with our performance. That's because he's not a performance-based God. A person who has unrealistic expectations of themselves and the situations around them is oftentimes going to have unrealistic expectations of their loved ones as well. They're going to be walking around not only riddled with disappointment, but with guilt. When we're in this mode, we're not only weighted down, but we make our spouse's burden very heavy. It may be one of the best things you can do for a burdened spouse is just to have a conversation and say, you know what, I think I have added burdens here and over here and with this situation with that, and then ask for forgiveness. When you tell them that you now realize that God has supplied all of your needs to give to them in every way possible, wow, what a load off they will feel. Let them know that your desire is to keep their burdens light by not making them feel like that there's some performance that they have to live up to. God does not want us to be weary and heavy laden. That's why he wants us to take up his way of doing it. His way is easy and light. When we live in the freedom of the cross, our sins, our imperfections, they all fade into the shadows, and Christ is what we see. When we live in the reality of the cross, other people's sins and failures fade away too. We stop looking at their performance and we stop keeping score. We look for ways to emulate our Savior. Then we find it a joy. It's actually a light and easy pleasure to serve. To even carry someone else's burden for them to maybe accomplish a task that should have been theirs. Because as we operate in this new system of grace, it's not about points. It's not their job or my job or our job. We create an atmosphere, a home of grace where we can't wait to serve that other person. So many times we think what will make us happy is if someone else does A, B, or C for us. And when they don't, we nosedive emotionally. But true joy is experienced when we are the ones giving and not keeping score. Another way of classifying this concept is the old 50-50 way of doing marriage. You know, you do your part, I'll do mine. You give this much and I'll give accordingly. But Jesus says, I've not prepared you to give half. I have prepared you to give 100%. Do you remember running out to the playground at recess and asking your best friend to get on the teeter-totter with you? I always tried to pick someone who was about the same size as me so we could go up and down, up and down. I was afraid of being stuck at the top if the other person on the other side was heavier than me. Or I was afraid that all of a sudden they would get off quickly and I'd come crashing to the ground. When we keep score in marriage, we're always asking the question, how balanced is our teeter-totter? Remember, as we see ourselves as a recipient of such abundant forgiveness and love, we forget to be the lawmaker and the policeman in our relationships. That's when we can't wait to be the generous giver. You see, in marriage, your teeter-totter is not supposed to be balanced. It's supposed to be totally out of whack with one side way up in the air and the other down on the ground. That's the beauty of God's law of grace, completely opposite of what we would come up with on our own. God has equipped us to tear down the scoreboard, to free our spouses from the burden of performing, just to receive love and acceptance from us. He's done this by giving us the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ, by freely lavishing on us what we don't deserve so we can give others what they don't deserve. We have the opportunity in our marriage. In fact, we have the calling in our marriage to be like our generous master. You've been listening to Vows to Keep Radio with David and Tracy Sellers. Vows to Keep offers Christ-centered marriage resources for couples wishing to prepare, enrich, and renew their marriages. Have you ever struggled with God's sovereignty? If so, get a hold of my new book, Romantic Historical Suspense, called Roots Reawakened. Follow the story of a young woman's journey from anger at God to a renewed relationship with Him. This is the first book in the Roots Run Deep series. More details about the trilogy on our website, vowstokeep.com. 
This program is sponsored by Vows to Keep of Zanesfield, Ohio.